This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heather Barnett. Viette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 32 The First Letter where it becomes time to inquire was paulina mary how fared my intercourse with the sumptuous hotel cressy that intercourse had for an interval been suspended by absence monsieur and miss de bazampierre had been travelling dividing some weeks between the provinces and capital of france chance apprised me of their return very shortly after it took place i was walking one mild afternoon on a quiet boulevard wandering slowly on enjoying the benign april sun and some thoughts not unpleasing when i saw before me a group of riders stopping as if they had just encountered and exchanging greetings in the midst of the broad smooth linden bordered path on one side a middle-aged gentleman and young lady on the other a young and handsome man very graceful was the lady's mien choice her appointments delicate and stately her whole aspect still as i looked i felt they were known to me and drawing a little nearer i fully recognized them all the count home de bazampierre his daughter and dr graham breton how animated was graham's face how true how warm yet how retiring the joy it expressed this was the state of things this the combination of circumstances at once to attract and enchain to subdue and excite dr john the pearl he admired was in itself of great price and truest purity but he was not the man who in appreciating the gem could forget its setting had he seen paulina with the same youth beauty and grace but on foot alone unguarded and in simple attire a dependent worker a demi grisette he would have thought her a pretty little creature and would have loved with his eye her movements and her mien but it required other than this to conquer him as he was now vanquished to bring him safe under dominion as now without loss and even with gain to his manly honour one saw that he was reduced there was about dr john all the man of the world to satisfy himself did not suffice society must approve the world must admire what he did or he counted his measures false and futile in his victrix he required all that was here visible the imprint of high cultivation the consecration of a careful and authoritative protection the adjuncts of fashion decrees wealth purchases and taste adjuncts for these conditions his spirit stipulated ere it surrendered they were here to the utmost fulfilled and now proud impassioned yet fearing he did homage to paulina as his sovereign as for her the smile of feeling rather than of conscious power slept soft in her eyes they parted he passed me at speed hardly feeling the earth he skimmed and seeing nothing on either hand he looked very handsome metal and purpose were roused in him fully papa there's lucy cried a musical friendly voice lucy dear lucy do come here I hastened to her. She threw back her veil and stooped from her saddle to kiss me. I was coming to see you tomorrow, said she, but now tomorrow you will come and see me. She named the hour, and I promised compliance. The morrow's evening found me with her. She and I shut into her own room. I had not seen her since that occasion when her claims were brought into comparison with those of Ginevra Fanshawe, and had so signally prevailed she had much to tell me of her travels in the interval and the most animated rapid speaker was she in such a tete a tete a most lively describer yet with her artless dictation and clear soft voice she never seemed to speak too fast or to say too much my own attention i think would not soon have flagged but by and by she herself seemed to need some change of subject she hastened to wind up her narrative briefly yet why she terminated with so concise an abridgment did not immediately appear silence followed a restless silence not without symptoms of abstraction then turning to me in a diffident half appealing voice lucy well i am at your side is my cousin ginevra still at madame beck's your cousin is still there you must be longing to see her no not much you want to invite her to spend another evening no i suppose she still talks about being married not to any one you care for 
but of course she still thinks of dr breton she cannot have changed her mind on that point because it was so fixed two months ago why you know it does not matter you saw the terms on which they stood there was a little misunderstanding that evening certainly does she seem unhappy not she to change the subject have you seen or seen nothing of or from graham during your absence papa had some letters from him once or twice about business i think he undertook the management of some affair which required attention while we were away dr breton seems to respect papa and to have pleasure in obliging him yes you met him yesterday on the boulevard you would be able to judge from his aspect that his friends need not be painfully anxious about his health papa seems to have thought with you i could not help smiling he is not particularly observant you know because he is often thinking of other things than what pass before his eyes but he said as dr breton rode away really it does a man good to see the spirit and energy of that boy he called dr breton a boy i believe he almost thinks him so just as he thinks me a little girl he was not speaking to me but dropped that remark to himself lucy again fell the appealing accent and at the same instant she left her chair and came and sat on the stool at my feet i liked her it is not a declaration i have often made concerning my acquaintance in the course of this book the reader will bear with it for once intimate intercourse close inspection disclosed in paulina only what was delicate intelligent and sincere therefore my regard for her lay deep an admiration more superficial might have been more demonstrative mine however was quiet what have you had to ask of lucy said i be brave and speak out but there was no courage in her eye as it met mine it fell and there was no coolness on her cheek not a transient surface blush but a gathering inward excitement raised its tint and its temperature lucy i do wish to know your thoughts of dr breton do do give me your real opinion of his character his disposition his character stands high and deservedly high and his disposition tell me about his disposition she urged you know him well i know him pretty well you know his home side you have seen him with his mother speak of him as a son he is a fine-hearted son his mother's comfort and hope her pride and pleasure she held my hand between hers and at each favourable word gave it a little caressing stroke in what other way is he good lucy dr breton is benevolent humanely disposed towards all his race dr breton would have benignity for the lowest savage or the worst criminal i heard some gentlemen some of papa's friends who were talking about him say the same they say many of the poor patients at the hospitals who tremble before some pitiless and selfish surgeons welcome him they are right i have witnessed as much he once took me over a hospital i saw how he was received your father's friends are right the softest gratitude animated her eye as she lifted it a moment she had yet more to say but seemed hesitating about time and place dusk was beginning to rain her parlour fire already glowed with twilight ruddiness but i thought she wished the room dimmer the hour later how quiet and secluded we feel here i remarked to reassure her do we yes it is a still evening and i shall not be called down to tea papa is dining out still holding my hand she played with the fingers unconsciously dressed them now in her own rings and now circled them with the twine of her beautiful hair she patted the palm against her hot cheek and at last having cleared a voice that was naturally liquid as a lark's she said you must think it rather strange that i should talk so much about dr breton ask so many questions take such an interest but not at all strange perfectly natural you like him and if i did said she with slight quickness is that a reason why i should talk i suppose you think me weak like my cousin ginevra if i thought you one whit like madame ginevra i would not sit here waiting for your communications i would get up walk at my ease about the room and anticipate all you had to say by a round lecture go on i mean to go on retorted she what else do you suppose i mean to do and she looked and spoke the little polly of breton petulant sensitive if she said emphatically if i liked dr john till i was fit to die for liking him that alone could not license me to be otherwise than dumb 
dumb as the grave dumb as you lucy snow you know it and you know you would despise me if i failed in self-control and whined about some rickety liking that was all on my side it is true i little respect women or girls who are loquacious either in boasting the triumphs or bemoaning the mortifications of feelings but as to you paulina speak for i earnestly wish to hear you tell me all it will give you pleasure or relief to tell i ask no more do you care for me lucy yes i do paulina and i love you i had an odd content in being with you even when i was a little troublesome disobedient girl it was charming to me then to lavish on you my naughtiness and whims now you are acceptable to me and i like to talk with you and trust you so listen lucy and she settled herself resting against my arm resting gently not with honest mistress fanshawe's fatiguing and selfish weight a few minutes since you asked whether we had not heard from graham during our absence and i said there were two letters for papa on business this was true but i did not tell you all you evaded i shuffled and equivocated you know however i am going to speak the truth now it is getting darker one can talk at one's ease papa often lets me open the letter-bag and give him out the contents one morning about three weeks ago you don't know how surprised i was to find amongst a dozen letters for monsieur de bassompierre a note addressed to miss de bassompierre i spied it at once amidst all the rest the handwriting was not strange it attracted me directly i was going to say papa here is another letter from dr breton but the miss struck me mute i actually never received a letter from a gentleman before ought i to have shown it to papa and let him open it and read it first i could not for my life lucy i know so well papa's ideas about me he forgets my age he thinks i am a mere schoolgirl he is not aware that other people see i am grown up as tall as i shall be so with a curious mixture of feelings some of them self-reproachful and some so fluttering and strong i cannot describe them i gave papa his twelve letters his herd of possessions and kept back my one my ewe lamb it lay in my lap during breakfast looking up at me with an inexplicable meaning making me feel myself a thing double existent a child to that dear papa but no more a child to myself after breakfast i carried my letter upstairs and having secured myself by turning the key in the door i began to study the outside of my treasure it was some minutes before i could get over the direction and penetrate the seal one does not take a strong place of this kind by instant storm one sits down a while before it as beleaguers say graham's hand is like himself lucy and so is his seal all clear firm and rounded no slovenly splash of wax a full solid steady drop a distinct impress no pointed turns harshly pricking the optic nerve but a clean mellow pleasant manuscript that soothes you as you read it is like his face just like the chiselling of his features do you know his autograph i have seen it go on the seal was too beautiful to be broken so i cut it round with my scissors on the point of reading the letter at last i once more drew back voluntarily it was too beautiful yet to drink that draught the sparkle in the cup was so beautiful i would watch it yet a minute then i remembered all at once that i had not said my prayers that morning having heard papa go down to breakfast a little earlier than usual i had been afraid of keeping him waiting and had hastened to join him as soon as dressed thinking no harm to put off prayers till afterwards some people would say i ought to have served god first and then man but i don't think heaven could be jealous of anything i might do for papa i believe i am superstitious a voice seemed now to say that another feeling than filial affection was in question to urge me to pray before i dared to read what i so longed to read to deny myself yet a moment and remember first a great duty i have had these impulses ever since i can remember i put the letter down and said my prayers adding at the end a strong entreaty that whatever happened i might not be tempted or led to cause papa any sorrow and might never in caring for others neglect him the very thought of such a possibility so pierced my heart that it made me cry but still lucy i felt that in time papa would have to be taught the truth managed and induced to hear reason i read the letter lucy life is said to be all disappointment i was not disappointed 
ere i read and while i read my heart did more than throb it trembled fast every quiver seemed like the pant of an animal athirst lay down at the well and drinking and the well proved quite full gloriously clear it rose up munificently of its own impulse i saw the sun through its gush and not a mote lucy no moss no insect no atom in the thrice refined golden gurgle life she went on is said to be full of pain to some i have read biographies where the wayfarer seemed to journey on from suffering to suffering where hope flew before him fast never lighting so near or lingering so long as to give his hand a chance of one realizing grasp i have read of those who sowed in tears and whose harvest so far from being reaped in joy perished by untimely blight or was borne off by sudden whirlwind and alas some of these met the winter with empty garners and died of utter want in the darkest and coldest of the year was it their fault paulina that they of whom you speak thus died not always their fault some of them were good endeavouring people i am not endeavouring nor actively good yet god has caused me to grow in sun due moisture and safe protection sheltered fostered taught by my dear father and now now another comes graham loves me for some minutes we both paused on this climax does your father know i inquired in a low voice graham spoke with deep respect of papa but implied that he dared not approach that quarter as yet he must first prove his worth he added that he must have some light respecting myself and my own feelings ere he ventured to risk a step in the matter elsewhere how did you reply i replied briefly but i did not repulse him yet i almost trembled for fear of making the answer too cordial graham's tastes are so fastidious i wrote it three times chastening and subduing the phrases at every rescript having confected it till it seemed to me to resemble a morsel of ice flavoured with ever so slight a zest of fruit or sugar i ventured to seal and dispatch it excellent paulina your instinct is fine you understand dr breton but how am i to manage papa there i am still in pain do not manage at all wait now only maintain no further correspondence till your father knows all and gives his sanction will he ever give it time will show wait dr breton wrote one other letter deeply grateful for my calm brief note but i anticipated your advice by saying that while my sentiments continued the same i could not without my father's knowledge write again you acted as you ought to have done so dr breton will feel it will increase his pride in you his love for you if either be capable of increase paulina that gentle hoarfrost of yours surrounding so much pure fine flame is a priceless privilege of nature you see i feel graham's disposition said she i feel that no delicacy can be too exquisite for his treatment it is perfectly proved that you comprehend him and then whatever dr breton's disposition were he one who expected to be more nearly met you would still act truthfully openly tenderly with your father lucy i trust i shall thus act always oh it will be a pain to wake papa from his dream and tell him i am no more a little girl be in no hurry to do so paulina leave the revelation to time and your kind fate i also have noticed the gentleness of her cares for you doubt not she will benignly order the circumstances and fitly appoint the hour yes i have thought over your life just as you yourself have thought over it i have made comparisons like those to which you adverted you know not the future but the past have been propitious as a child i feared for you nothing that has life was ever more susceptible than your nature in infancy under harshness or neglect neither your outward nor your inward self would have ripened to what they now are much pain much fear much struggle would have troubled the very lines of your features broken the regularity would have harassed your nerves into the fever of habitual irritation you would have lost in health and cheerfulness in grace and sweetness providence has protected and cultured you not only for your own sake but i believe for graham's his star too was fortunate to develop fully the best of his nature a companion like you was needed there you are ready you must be united i knew it the first day i saw you together at la terrasse in all that mutually concerns you and graham there seems to me promise plan harmony i do not think the sunny youth of either will prove the forerunner of stormy age i think it is deemed good that you two should live in peace and be happy not as angels but as few are happy amongst mortals some lives are thus blessed 
it is god's will it is the attesting trace and lingering evidence of eden other lives run from the first another course other travellers encounter weather fitful and gusty wild and variable breast adverse winds are beflated and overtaken by the early closing winter nights neither can this happen without the sanction of god and i know that amidst his boundless works is somewhere stored the secret of this last fate's justice i know that his treasures contain the proof as the promise of its mercy End of chapter thirty two